Hallo zusammen und willkommen zurück zu unserem Kanal. Ähm, wir haben ja in den letzten beiden Videos angefangen, das breitere Thema Nahrungsketten abzudecken. Äh, Im letzten Video zum, Thema, zum speziellen Thema Symbiosen. Und äh, dazu haben wir heute nochmal ein Interview für euch mit einer Expertin, die euch was erzählt über die spezielle Symbiose zwischen Algen und Korallen. Und dazu ein paar Fragen beantwortet, bevor wir dann in der nächsten Zeit wieder weitere Videos auch zum, zum großen Thema machen. Heute also nochmal ein Interview. Ja, zu dem Interview freuen wir uns heute sehr, dass wir ähm, unsere ehemalige Kollegin Melissa einladen konnten. Melissa ist auch Meeresbiologin, so wie wir, hat einen Abschluss in Meeresbiologie von dem Eckert College in Florida und auch von der King Abdullah University und ist zurzeit PhD-Studentin an der University of New South Wales in Australien, wo sie eben an Korallen und ihrer Symbiose mit Algen arbeitet und forscht. Ganz äh, besonders interessiert sie dabei, wie die und diese Symbiose ähm, unter dem Stress des Bleachings, also unter verschiedenen Prozessen des Bleachings, ähm, über das sie doch später noch ein bisschen was erzählen wird, leiden oder auch damit ähm, klarkommen können. Und ja, alles, was da so mit zusammenhängt, wird sie uns dann in den nächsten zehn Fragen beantworten. Viel Spaß dabei. Ja, genau, viel Spaß. Wenn ihr Fragen habt, natürlich gerne in die Kommentare oder auch einfach direkt an uns persönlich stellen. Auch die Melissa werden wir unten verlinken. Da könnt ihr euch also natürlich gerne auch mal mit Fragen melden oder mit Anregungen. Wir freuen uns drüber. Erstmal viel Spaß. Well then, yeah, once again, thank you very much for joining us today and for uh, agreeing on answering a few questions about symbiosis in the sea. And I'm very happy that you yeah, agreed on participating in this. Yeah, of course. Happy to do this. So you're currently a PhD student at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, right? So. Can you tell us a bit more about what your research uh, is and the topic of your PhD? Yes, so I am working um, on corals on the Great Barrier Reef. So even though I'm located in Sydney, most of my research is focused up in Northern Australia. Um, my specific research is looking at the symbiotic relationship between microscopic algae and coral. And these little microscopic algae uh, photosynthesize and produce food for the coral. So this relationship is very important for the survival of coral. Um, however, climate change is causing a disruption in that communication. My research is looking at what types of algae live in coral. So there are many different species and um, genera of these algae, which have different thermal tolerances. They have different abilities to provide food or carbon to the host and different benefits. Um, so I'm looking at different diversity of algae that live inside of the coral. And then I'm also looking at the question of if coral can recover from bleaching, how do they do that on this cellular level? And looking at the community of the symbionts, these microscopic algae that come back after bleaching and seeing if that community has changed at all. Different species increasing in abundance or um, some benefits coming back to the host that might be better for increasing temperatures. So there might be an increase in more thermally tolerant species of algae. And I'm kind of just watching a community shift of these algae in coral after bleaching and during recovery, and hopefully finding some answers to see if corals will be able to adapt to warming oceans. So do all corals have a symbiosis with these algae or just a few of them? So not all corals have this relationship with algae. Um, the hard corals that build reefs, most of them do. Those that do not are called a aposymbiotic or aposozenthelic. Um, so that just means that they don't have these algae. Um, those corals are predominantly heterotrophic feeders. So they filter feed any type of carbon or material from the ocean with little tentacles that come out of their polyps. Um, and that's how they sustain themselves. So they don't have this partnership with a photosynthetic algae that produces carbon from the power of the sun. So yes, there are both types. There are ones that have algae and ones that don't. And those that do, uh, they're benefiting from it, right? So could you explain us a bit what or why this relationship is positive for, for the partners, for the coral and for the symbionts? Yeah, exactly. So having algae as a partner, in it helps with um, feeding you. It helps with providing enough carbon for 
sustaining growth and reproduction. Um, the ability of coral to live in very clear tropical water that doesn't have a lot of nutrients floating around in the water column is due to this relationship with the microscopic algae. So tropical coral reefs don't really have a lot of nutrients in the water and that's why they're so clear and beautiful. And that's what allows the sun to penetrate into the water column, giving energy to any type of organism that photosynthesizes. And without that, without the algal partnership, they wouldn't be able to survive in these clear tropical waters. And also in having this relationship with these algae, they're able to provide a huge ecosystem. They're the builders of the ecosystem of the reef. And without that partnership, it wouldn't be sustainable. It wouldn't be able to provide a home or space or food for other organisms that live on the reef. So that's how, that's a couple of the benefits that they have um, by hosting these algae. So do all corals have the same algae? So I think you, you started talking about this already, that you're looking into the different algae they're, they're associating with in your thesis, uh, but are there differences between species or locations or, or what, what causes these differences between the species? Exactly. So back when it was first discovered that coral even had this relationship with microscopic algae, that there was a symbiosis between two organisms here, and it wasn't just one organism, um, scientists believed that there was just one species of algae or just one type. Um, however, with really amazing genetic tools that we have today that we can look at DNA sequences of these algae, we're actually able to see the sequences diverge so much so that they represent different species or different types. Um, most of these species haven't been described in complete detail because it takes a lot of work to describe a new species, but we do know that there are multiple genera and that already shows us the diversity of this algae that has a relationship with coral. It's already showing us that it's on orders of magnitudes that we were not even aware of. So the diversity is really important because different species of algae or different types of algae might have different benefits or drawbacks to the coral. And in some locations, for example, in the Red Sea, where it's really hot and salty, corals might have a different species of algae to tolerate that heat. Whereas species of algae that um, are most common in the Great Barrier Reef come from a certain genus that provide um, an amazing amount of carbon to the coral. And there's different types of genera that can be present in one coral at once. So you can have multiple species present in one coral. And that's where it really gets interesting to see how the community structure might change with climate change, might change with disturbances in the environment. And what can we start to infer from the changes in that community that will allow us to tell us, are those species more thermally tolerant? Are they better at providing growth and nutrients to the coral? And how can we piece apart different um, characteristics and things that these algae do for the coral by watching how that community dynamic changes when there's an environmental disturbance like bleaching or sedimentation or anything else that happens that the coral needs to change to adapt to. So as we're already talking about bleaching, can you tell us a bit more what that actually is and what causes bleaching? Because not everyone might be aware of the concept of bleaching. Yeah, so the, I guess the accepted definition of bleaching has been the loss of microscopic algae, which are termed zooxanthellae. So the loss of actual zooxanthellae cells from the coral or the loss of their pigmentation. So the zooxanthellae have pigmentation, which allows it to photosynthesize the, the chlorophyll that exists in its cell. If the coral loses the actual cell, the actual microscopic algal cell, that's considered bleaching. If the microscopic algal cell loses its pigmentation, that's also considered bleaching. And what happens during bleaching is when there's a loss of the algae, we as humans see the coral as white because the tissue of the coral is usually transparent, doesn't have much pigmentation itself, and we're seeing straight through the tissue right into the white skeleton 
So that's why the term bleaching has been used and has been used in that way. Um, the things that cause bleaching can be many different types of env environmental disturbances, things like sedimentation or poor water quality or changes in salinity. The relationship between the coral animal and the microscopic algae is so sensitive that a slight change in, in water quality could cause it to bleach. However, bleaching is not, not always a bad thing. Bleaching doesn't always indicate that the coral is going to die, but one of the major causes of bleaching right now is increases in, in the water temperature, and that's due to climate change. So we're seeing that reefs around the world are, are getting hotter and hotter, and corals at this moment are already living at their thermal tolerance or a very um, upper limit to their thermal tolerance. And so we see that even with an increase of one to two degrees Celsius of that water around a coral can cause this relationship between the algae and the coral to break down, and then we see bleaching from there. That's a little bit of an um, introduction of, of what bleaching is. So when, you, when you're saying that uh, the corals not necessarily die when they're bleached, so how could they potentially survive the bleaching? What are, what are the options for them if they're bleaching? Mm. So corals themselves are animals, and even though they have this relationship with an organism that photosynthesizes and provides it with 90 to 99% of its required food source, basically through the power of the sun, the animal itself can still feed. And it's similar if you can imagine hundreds of upside down jellyfish on a rock structure and they're all connected and they're all communicating to each other. They have tentacles that are able to reach into the water col column and filter out particles of food. So they can heterotrophically feed in that sense and they can try to sustain themselves through what they're finding in the water column. Um, however, that doesn't last very long. It's not very sustainable because as I said, the corals that have zooxanthellae, that have these relationship with this microscopic algae, typically live in very clear tropical waters where there's not a lot of nutrients. So corals do as much as they can to feed themselves until the temperature drops or until that environmental disturbance passes. And in that case, they can either acquire zooxanthellae from the water column, or they can have whatever is left in their polyps repopulate and grow. So we're hoping that even though increases in water temperature might cause bleaching, that with a drop in temperature or with a return to the normal state, we might actually see corals recover. And they, they do have an amazing ability to recover. It's just that, the ability to recover needs to be fast enough to match the process of climate change and the process of heating. And the longer you have a very hot, stagnant water over, reef, over a reef, the less likely you'll have that coral to recover from bleaching. Well, this is not, uh, this is not the first uh, group of animals that you're working on that lives in such a symbiotic set. We work with giant plants before that all live in a symbiotic relationship with these algae. Um, is there a difference between these two symbiotic relationships between corals and the algae and the plants and the rest? Yes. Um, yeah, so before I worked on corals, because my, my passion for this research really comes from the relationship between an animal cell and an algal cell and how does that work and how what does that look like i didn't mind working on different study subjects so another animal that has this photosynthetic relationship the symbiotic relationship with microscopic algae is the giant clam and the giant clam was able to become giant because of this relationship um, basically allowing an animal to heterotrophically feed and then combining that food source with a photosynthetic food source. So it's just providing so much carbon to an animal that this excess energy has then translated into a growth of a mollusk that's giant compared to other clams. Um, the difference between, or well, there's a couple differences between coral and giant clams and how their relationship with this microscopic algae works. One of the interesting 
differences is that in giant clams, instead of hosting just a single cell layer of microscopic algae in their outer tissue, they actually possess tubules that are stacked with these cells. And giant clams have a really cool way of accessing or bringing light to each of these symbiont cells in these tubules. So you can think of them almost as um, capillary tubes, like a blood vessel or something, reaching deep into the clam, and then their surface is right at the, the mantle of the clam. And they actually have really cool cells that act as mirrors to direct the light from the surface to reach all of these microscopic algae cells in the stacked tube. So they have a different way of storing their algae. And um, giant clams have a higher heterotrophic feeding capacity. So the ability to feed themselves through whatever they find in the water column, filter feeding, um, is, is higher in giant clams. And that helps them um, sustain through warmer temperatures. And it, it seems to be um, a reason why they may not bleach as quickly as, as corals. And that might also have to do with how they store their symbiotic algae. But it is really interesting because giant clams and corals both host the same types of algae as well. So we might be able to determine what kind of characteristics do these types have and can a different host tell us something different about that algae itself. So besides the reef building corals and the clams, are there other, other organisms or other you know, marine organisms that are living in such a relationship with these algae? There, there are, um, for example, jellyfish. Jell some types of jellyfish have a relationship with algae. Um, some types of nudibranchs have a relationship with algae. There are also sponges that have this relationship. Um, but we're really, the essential relationship is found in corals just because corals are the, the builders of the ecosystem. But it is interesting to see other animals with this relationship because if you can imagine even as a human having microscopic algae in our skin and being able to lie out in the sun and provide extra food for ourselves, that would be amazing. And so these animals have an advantage where they're able to have an, another source of food rather than just feeding themselves heterotrophically. So it is really interesting to see all those different relationships and how they play out in different hosts. So besides the relationship between the corals or the, the plants or the other organisms that you mentioned that live in a symbiotic relationship with algae, there, I think there are also other partners involved in these symbiosis, right? Can you, can you go over into detail with that? Yeah, exactly. Um, there's this concept of for example, if we just look at a, a coral as, as the animal that we're talking about, um, there's the concept of this holobiont, which is something that has been brought up um, for humans, actually. So a human is its own ecosystem of different bacteria and viruses and uh, microscopic organisms that live on and in our bodies. So the idea that we have um, a whole plethora, a whole community of bacteria in our gut that help us um, digest and absorb nutrients from our food is similar to corals and similar to many other organisms. Um, they kind of represent their own ecosystem. And so there are other things that live in symbiosis with corals, not just the microscopic algae, but you have bacteria and viruses and, and fungus and other things that help a coral exist as it is and also adapt to changes. A lot of the research on these symbiotic relationships hasn't really been studied as well. And so we're still really, we're learning about what do bacteria do for corals and does the bacterial community change when it bleaches or when it recovers from bleaching. And it's a very interesting concept because there might be some, some help in, in the sense of probiotics for corals when we're looking at how to keep a coral healthy. Is it similar to how we keep humans healthy by providing probiotics for our gut? <laughs> so yes, there are other things that live in symbiosis with corals. And then of course you have outside of the organism itself, you have other animals that help um, help it function as well. So you have, you have little crabs that live inside of corals and keep away predators. And you have fish that kind of form communities inside of corals and juvenile fish find home and habitat there as well. So 
yeah, it's a, it's a crazy system of symbiosis all around on the micro scale to the macro scale. Coming to our last question, you also said that, well, you, you told us that corals and reefs are under threat of system threats from different high temperatures or nutrient input or um, whatever else is stressing them. But is there any chance or anything that we can do to help the corals? So uh, this, is a, this is a great question because this is probably one of the most important things that scientists should be communicating to the public is that we have all these facts. We know all the kind of devastating news about climate change threatening these ecosystems. But if we don't provide answers for people, if we don't provide ways of helping, then it seems very hopeless and it seems scary to address these big problems. Um, helping corals specifically, I think first and foremost, if you can, go out and actually experience what it's like to see a coral reef and, and see what it is because seeing something and, and falling in love with it makes you want to protect it more. And it's such an abstract idea when, if you've never been to the ocean, if you've never even seen what a coral looks like, or if you've always thought that a coral was a rock, or if it was just something that wasn't living, it's very hard to care about it. And it's very hard to want to do anything to, to help them. But specific actions, for, for example, things that I do is I'm very conscious about my, my own diet because in terms of trying to combat climate change, the idea of eating less meat or eating sustainably, trying to understand what is sustainable in your local community is really good for just trying to tackle the idea, the, the intense problem of climate change itself. Um, coral specifically, if you're out on the reef, like you can always get involved in citizen science projects where you're replanting corals, there are coral um, fragmentation, farming, and um, restoration sites that you can get involved in. Um, other things are just being aware, educating yourself, and um, in terms of tackling the, the big question of trying to keep the world from heating up too much, it's just your own choices at home, your own individual choices of being eco-friendly and being aware of what you're buying and consuming and doing in your life that has an impact, has a much larger impact than, than you would think. But I think for anyone who's interested in helping the corals, it's really go out there and experience it if you can. If you can't, try to learn as much as you can. There's many documentaries on corals and the idea of just being more eco-literate, being more aware of the science and, and what's going on in the world with these ecosystems is really helpful. And yeah, that's probably the, the best thing that I can say in terms of helping corals. Um, I think that it's just really important to be aware that this symbiotic relationship between coral and microscopic algae has been around for millions of years. I mean, it's not that the corals are going to not exist in the future. They may not be healthy enough to sustain an entire ecosystem, but they were they will prevail. Like no matter if humans are here or not, corals have been here for so much longer than we have that it's not that they're going to go away forever. But I think the idea of um, having it sustain entire ecosystems probably is what is the biggest threat at the moment, and kind of what shook me is the idea that this relationship that's so essential that you know everything in the ocean really comes down to coral reefs and the fact that that habitat exists that relationship is so essential but it's so fragile as well and just any slight change in the environment and because we've kind of pushed corals past things that they can handle on without bleaching we're pushing them closer and closer to that bleaching threshold. And if we can't figure out how they can recover from that, we're not really sure how to predict things for the future and how do we help protect things if we don't understand how it will respond. And so that that's kind of just where my research fits in of trying to understand what is the recovery process and how quickly can corals do this? And just questions like what kind of cells come back? What kind of symbiotic algae comes back? And is that going to be available in the future? Um, yeah, so I guess that's that's kind of like a good summary of 
of what I work on and, and the things that I care about. And I specifically care about bringing science to people. So I'm really interested in, in communicating this type of science and the care for coral reefs to the general public because you can't just have your team of scientists working on it. It has to be as many people as possible to make a difference. Melissa ist übrigens auch sehr aktiv in Science Communication. Guckt euch doch deswegen gerne auch mal ihre Website emergentcreativesofscience.com an, auf der sie gemeinsam mit anderen Meereswissenschaftlern Kunst und Wissenschaft verbindet. Das Projekt hat auch einen Instagram-Account, den ihr unter ecos-sciart findet. Dort findet ihr dann auch Melissas absolut coole Projekte, inklusive meines persönlichen Favoriten unter dem Titel Symbiose.